Good morning, guys. Today's read aloud, well, this morning's read aloud is brought to you fresh from my living room and fresh out of bed. And so I will be reading chapter two this morning in Navigating Early by Claire Vanderpool. And I will have chapter three posted um, later on today. So two chapters today. Chapter two. The next day was filled with boys, boxes, and bulletin boards, suitcases, books, and pillows, and everywhere there were moms giving bosomy hugs and tear-filled kisses. I spent most of the day in the library, wandering from shelf to shelf, breathing in the familiar smell of books and wood polish and India ink. It felt good to be closed in among the stacks, which didn't pitch and sway. They were solid and stable. Maybe that's how cows feel when they come into the barn after a day in the open field. The librarian introduced herself in a quiet librarian-y manner, saying her name was Miss B. She smiled and said it was short for bookworm. I didn't say much, so she gave me a quick tour of the library, showing me the fiction section and resource books, and she got particularly excited with the poetry collection. When I didn't match her level of enthusiasm for Longfellow and Hopkins, she just smiled, encouraged me to have a look around, and returned to her card catalog. I wandered around the stacks until I found the National Geographic magazines. Standing in front of those bright yellow spines all lined up in numerical order, it felt for a moment like I had a place, a tiny spot where I belonged. Then the door flung open and two boys poked their heads in. Glancing around, they apparently didn't find who or what they were looking for and left. There had been no opportunity for introductions, but even if there had, I wasn't sure what I would have said. Hi, my name is Jack. I'm from Kansas, and I wish I was still there. Still, it would have been nice to have, at, had, have had at least a couple of names to put with those faces. There was a large trophy case on the far wall of the library. Maybe some of those boys' pictures will be in there. The case was full of trophies and plaques from years in Morton Hill Academy victories. Basketball, football, track, and field. Mixed in were pictures of young men in their team uniforms, smiling with the joy of winning and standing with arms over each other's shoulders in a show of camaraderie. I studied the faces, ripe, ruddy, youthful, as if they were faces from history. That was pretty much what they were, as the dates stretched all the way back to the late 1800s. As I walked the length of the trophy case, the faces spanned the years, one blurring into the next. Then one stood out. An older boy stood in a picture all his own. His hair was slicked back and he had strong, handsome face. Written at the bottom, in white ink, were the words, Morton Hill, all team captain, rowing and football, class of 1943. The picture rested against a jersey with the player's name and the number on the back, Fish 67. But it wasn't the jersey or the trophy that held my attention. It was his face, his smile. He smiled as if he held life in that championship cup and he could drink from it whenever he liked. He smiled as if that victorious moment would last forever. Then I noticed my own reflection in the glass. My face was different. Not just because it was younger, not just because I wasn't smiling, but because the past summer had taught me a lesson that, from the looks of it, the all-team captain had yet to learn. 
life can't be held in a cup and nothing lasts forever. Suddenly, I felt sorry for number 67 and all he didn't know. Monday morning came like a cool Kansas rain shower on a hot, humid day. In other words, it was a relief. Because now, at least, I had a schedule. I knew that history came first, followed by Latin, English, and math. Science and phys ed were held in the afternoon. I figured if I knew what was coming, maybe I'd get my bearings. That's what I needed. Bearings. At home, you could walk outside and see for miles in every direction. You could always figure out where you were based on which church steeple or which windmill or silo rose like a beacon out of the horizon. They were landmarks that served to keep a person rooted, grounded. But then it stuck me, struck me. To have landmarks, you have to have land. And the salt air filling my lungs reminded me that most of what surrounded me in this place was water. Constantly moving, changing water. I started to feel queasy again. The history teacher was a short man with stubby fingers who seemed very excited about a bunch of Greeks who all must have been from the same family. Oedipus, Perseus, Theseus. His name was Professor Donaldson. He called, me, he called roll, and every kid said here except for one. Early out in. Latin, Mr. Hildebrandt, same roll call, same kid absent, early out in. All the way until math. Then who showed up? Early out in. And I recognized him. It was the kid from the beach. The boy with the sandbags. He was a little fella. About four foot something, his feet dangled just above the floor when he sat at his desk. Good morning, gentlemen, the math teacher greeted us as he set down his mug of steaming coffee. My name is Professor Eric Blaine, he said as he began writing on the chalkboard. As many of you know, this is my first year at Morton Hill, and I'm looking forward to getting acquainted with each and every one of you. He turned to face us and we all stared at what he'd written on the board, the Holy Grail. We all know from the legend of King Arthur about Sir Galahad and his search for the Holy Grail, that sacred, mysterious, and oh-so-elusive chalice used at the Last Supper. For centuries, he has been revered as a miraculous vessel. Sorry. For centuries, it has been revered as a miraculous vessel and has been sought after by kings and princes, humanitarians and tyrants. There is supposedly a brotherhood of guardians to keep it safe, or might we say, keep its mysterious allure from being evaluated in the light of modern day knowledge and skepticism. Mr. Blaine sat on the desk in the front room we're not here to discuss the authenticity of the grail, but rather the nature and merits of a quest. Why does one embark upon a quest? Mr. Blaine looked down at his seating chart and glanced around the room. Sam Feeney, a pudgy kid sitting next to me, squinted an eye. Err, to find buried treasure, matey, the other boys laughed. Spoken like a true pirate said Mr. Blaine. But yes, to search for something. It can be a treasure. However, it can also be a search for something less tangible. Ever hear of a quest for happiness? A quest for justice? Buried treasure sounds a little more exciting, said Sam. Maybe. But what about a quest for the truth? Perhaps that was really Sir Galahad's goal? to demystify the miraculous? What if he was looking for the grail, that miraculous vessel, to show that it was just a cup? The boys looked at the teacher with furrowed brows. Geez, Mr. Blaine, you sure know how to take the fun out of a good story, said Robbie Dean Meyer, a red-haired kid I'd sat by in Latin. And besides, isn't this 
class. Precisely. So what does this have to do with math? said Mr. Blaine. What is the holy grail of mathematics? Something that is so mysterious as to be considered by many almost miraculous. Something woven throughout the world of mathematics. A number that is nothing less than never-ending. Eternal. Several hands shot up at the last clue. Preston Townsend? That would be Pi, sir, answered an athletic-looking boy in the second row. His hair was precisely combed, and the way he sat back in his chair, poised with pencil in hand, he looked like he was about to call an important meeting to order. I figured his father must be a banker or a politician or maybe the governor, of the great state of Maine. Yes, pi, the holy grail of mathematics, that mysterious number that has entranced mathematicians for millennia. It, origi it originated with the Babylonians, was used by the Greeks in measuring the earth, and was thought to be a miraculous number by some and the work of the devil by others. So what is the number pi? Robbie Dean? That's a trick question, Mr. Blaine. Everyone knows that pi starts with 3.14 and keeps on going. We all had to memorize the first 100 digits last year. But pi is... The whole class joined him in saying, a never-ending, never-repeating number. See, everyone knows that, concluded Bobby Dean. You mean everyone has accepted that as fact? countered Mr. Blaine. We shifted in our seats, unsure of what he meant. Alongside Sir Galahad, I believe we can add another name to the list of great seekers. His name is Professor Douglas Stanton. He is a mathematician at Cambridge who is on a quest of his own. He has spent much of his career studying this number and has a theory that contrary to popular belief, Pi is not a never-ending number. That, yes, it is an amazing number that has over 700 digits currently known and thousands more that haven't been calculated yet, but he believes it will, in fact, end. Mr. Blaine brushed the chalk dust from his fingers. Why do I mention this today? Because this year we are going to embark on a quest of our own to expand our minds, to challenge what we think we know, and to push the boundaries of mathematics. If pi, the most venerable number, can be proven to end, what else are we blindly believing that might be put to the test? So, Mr. Blaine loosened his tie. Let's get down to the business at hand. Open your textbooks to page one and let's begin. I glanced behind me, but Early's desk was empty and the classroom door quietly shut. That's it for chapter two. I will post the update video for chapter three later on today. Have a good day. And this is Corn. She's kind of an okay nurse cat. Most of the time, she's really grouchy.